Fighting games are just the best, you know? There's legitimately nothing that can match the intensity, fun, or complexity of a well-made fighting game. Lots of fighting games feel absolutely daunting from the outset, but if you take the time to learn them, you start to find things you can apply to other fighting games. That's really what makes fighters so appealing. They all have some similar mechanics across them, but the different systems, art styles, settings, and unique flares to the gameplay is what helps a lot of people find their perfect game. Are you into a super diverse character roster with a lot of different visual themes and over-the-top combos? Killer Instinct! Do you want hyper-violent gore combos with a story mode that... functions? Mortal Kombat! Do you just really like Dragon Ball? Thankfully, there's finally a good one. But it's in that similar template of the one-on-one -on -one fighting game that you have a lot of wiggle room, places to take the experience and make it unlike anything else, for better and for worse. Weird fighting games are some of the most interesting games on the market for how they take the safety net of fighting games and just stretch it as thin as they can to fit whatever weird idea they have. And today, I want to go over four of the strangest fighting games I could find. Now, it should go without saying that they made more than four weird fighting games. For God's sakes, Fight Crab isn't even in this video. I just wanted to have a cutoff point so I didn't ramble on. Besides, after Punch-Out, I kind of want an idea I can milk for just a little bit longer. Now, this first game, I'll admit, on the outside, doesn't exactly fit the other games we're gonna be talking about, or even your preconceived notions of a weird fighting game. Those are weird for their presentation and mechanics. This game was made by one of the most reputable fighting game companies in the business, based on an incredibly popular anime that just happens to be one of the strangest fighting games of all time. And it had to be based on my favorite anime. <laughs> God, I love Fist of the North Star! I am not an anime guy, by any stretch of the imagination, but Fist of the North Star is so good! The quintessential 80s manime, Fist of the North Star is everything I could ever want out of a piece of media. Hyperviolent martial arts in a post-apocalyptic setting is such a specific combination that Fist of the North Star does perfectly. This may sound like a blatant ad by me to get you interested in reading or watching Fist of the North Star, which you can do with the ongoing reprint series released by Vizor on Crunchyroll for free, but let's focus on the topic at hand, Hokuto no Ken for PS2. Seeing as it's one of the most profitable media franchises of all time, thank you very much, you f***ing pachinko demon, Fist of the North Star has had a healthy amount of video games. Spanning RPGs, fighting games, visual novels, warriors games, Fist of the North Star Legacy of the Savior for PS1, which defies explanation, Fist of the North Star is well-trodden ground in the history of video games. It wasn't until 2005, however, that Arc System Works, the team behind Guilty Gear, Blaze Blue, Dragon Ball Fighters, and Persona 4 Arena, were given the job of making a Fist of the North Star fighting game, with a PS2 version coming out in 2007. This game has a roster made up of 10 of the most popular characters from the original manga, or as I like to put it, there are no Land of Ashura Arc characters. These characters include Kenshiro, Kung Fu Jesus, Rao, Kung Fu Satan, Toki, Literally Kung Fu Jesus, Jaggy, Fuck Jaggy, and many more. This game has a few different modes, like a basic arcade, survival, and what can loosely be called history mode, since... I mean, it kinda retells the story of the original manga. I mean, it's all in Japanese, so I'm not exactly the target audience. First things first, and I know this is just my bias talking, but to me, this is the most beautiful pixel art fighting game ever made. The detail in every aspect of the animation, character design, and backgrounds is unreal. This game looks fantastic, even today, and the art direction has so much to do with that. Every character and stage is chocked full of fun references and details for fans of the franchise, including some specific moves only doable on certain characters while playing as other characters. As an example, Jaggy has a command grab that can only be used against the character Shin, and the move itself is a recreation of the speech that Jaggy gives to Shin that makes him turn against Kenshiro. And the best part? It's completely worthless! Only works in one matchup and isn't even useful there. One more accurate change that actually benefits the character is the Holy Nanto Emperor, Souser, or Souther, or... Souther? There's a near infinite amount of ways to pronounce his name. He has the Holy Emperor's armor, which makes him immune to the effects of Hokuto Shinken that make you do the meme. If Kenshiro uses the special move that kills the opponent after three seconds on Souser, it does nothing. Let me put it like this. 
There's a character in this game named Yuda, who has two assist characters that he can call out. Yuda can also accidentally hit one of them, Dargal, and then the next time you call him out, Dargal will hit you instead. Then, the next time you call Dargal out and he tries to hit you, you can use your level 1 to kill Dargal just like Yuda does in the manga, which means you can't call him out for the rest of the fight. This game was made with such a love and appreciation for Fist of the North Star that comes through in every second of gameplay. That love and appreciation has a major effect on the gameplay, and no, I'm not talking about character-specific command grabs or actively gimping yourself. The seven stars of death are always present below your character, and if you're hit with specific moves, you can have your stars broken. Break all seven and the final star of death appears below you. If you can then land your deadly move, you kill the opponent instantly. In most fighting games, instant kill moves are either overly flashy and impossible to hit, or just flat-out gags. In Hokuto no Ken, they're pretty much the bread and butter of the entire game. Stars can recover between rounds, but not all the way, so if you're smart in what attacks you use and when you use them, you can start a round, break their last stars, and kill them early. Those deadly moves as well are filled with so much appreciation for the source material, from Ken's 100 crack fist actually hitting 100 times, Souser's deadly moves changing depending on the stage he's on, Ray having like three different versions of his deadly move, because you can really tell he was getting more popular than Kenshiro at this point, even Shin has a special move recreating his death from the manga. That sounds like a spoiler, but trust me, Kenshiro getting revenge on his lifelong friend who kidnapped and then supposedly killed his girlfriend is the inciting incident of the story. It's like spoiling Raditz dying. So you may be wondering, wow Jack, can you shill for Fist of the North Star any harder? God, if only they would let me. But more pressingly, okay Jack, why is this game so strange then? Well, the answer is honestly pretty simple. Hokuto no Ken is the most broken functioning game ever made. It doesn't crash, it doesn't delete your save file, the game functions as intended, but the way it's intended to function is completely broken. Every character in the game has an infinite combo. These infinite combos are not fast, they take the whole round to execute, oftentimes more than a round, leading to lots of timeout finishes. Characters like Toki and Rei are infamous for the fact that getting hit by them once allows them to dribble the opponent like a basketball. Let's talk about those two. So, Toki in the manga is the original successor of Hokuto Shinken, but abdicates his position after falling terminally ill from radiation poisoning. Again, not a spoiler, you learn that before you learn his name. In order to make him lore accurate, Toki is the strongest character in the game by a wide margin. He has three different counters, a reflector and fireball absorber that allows him to automatically break a star, tons of mobility options including a full screen eight directional dash, tons of moves that break stars automatically, amazing special moves that either fit into his combos or power up his already great moves, and the ability to combo his teleport into his normal moves, meaning you're always in range. As if that wasn't enough, Toki also has the best fatal KO in the game that hits on both sides, full screen, and is near impossible to avoid. You know he's the best character in the game when the official wiki lists one of the only reasons to not play him as a loss of popularity. And as for Ray, he has potentially the funniest move in any video game ever. See, he has a fairly standard Shoryuken. It's an alright move, not one of Ray's better tools, but does the most damage of any move in the entire game. Not to the opponent, to the game. If you do an aerial boost with this move after performing a grave shoot attack, the move will hit an infinite amount of times which causes the arcade board to overclock and start getting really, really hot, which can either damage the arcade machine permanently or make it burst into flames. The wiki warns you, don't use this move on real hardware, it could destroy it. Hokuto no Ken on a fundamental level is not a good fighting game if you look at it in the way that most people look at a fighting game. But Hokuto no Ken succeeds in spite of itself. Despite being completely busted in every sense of the word, with infinites, broken characters, and a game system system that is loose enough to allow every character to do everything, Hokuto no Ken is still one of the most beloved fighting games of all time, and surprisingly, it's for all those reasons. In the fighting game community, there is a term called kusoge, literally translating to shit game. Kusoge started as a disparaging remark made towards low quality trash, but the FGC latched onto it and changed the definition. Now Kusoge refers to shit game. 
that is fun to play nonetheless. And pretty much every defining feature of a Kusoge is found in Hokuto no Ken infinites, unbalanced characters, and the ability to dribble the opponent like a basketball. Hokuto no Ken may not work like every other fighting game, but it's all the better for it. Anime fighting games are a dime a dozen, but Hokuto no Ken being such enjoyable trash is what makes it stand out. Hokuto no Ken tournaments at Evo and other such fighting game events are less fighting game competitions and more so performance pieces, with people having a lot of fun getting hit with those basketball combos. They'll play other games, take selfies, even attempt to bribe the opponent into dropping the combo, which makes this game so much fun to see. There's also the chance you're going to see the greatest fighting game match of all time, like this beautiful 240p Kenshiro and Rei match. Everyone who plays it knows what Hokuto no Ken is. No one is going in expecting a well-balanced, fair, and inoffensive fighting game. Hokuto no Ken is utter chaos from the start of the match to the end. It can be enjoyed for what it's intended to be, but ignoring those flaws is ignoring what makes the game the most fun. It's a broken, buggy mess of a game, but in a sea of bland, paint-by-numbers anime fighters, being the most batshit insane example of one is a mark of pride. Think of the great fighting game rosters of all time. You have Street Fighter's simple yet brilliant archetypes that shaped the entire genre, Tekken's mix of intense martial artists with blood feuds spanning generations, and the best character in any video game ever, and Mortal Kombat! Insert barb about Mortal Kombat ninjas here! Oh crap, that's stage direction. But where's the heavy metal fighting game? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 not you, Weapon Lords. I mean real heavy metal. BCV Battle Construction Vehicle is exactly the fighting game that the people have been begging for. Swapping out footsies, wake-up combos, and okies for a 2009 Caterpillar DN5 Crawler Bulldozer. Now, the immediate assumption with this was, oh man, this is a fighting game based on an anime, just like Fist of the North Star. Well, if you can believe it, because I certainly did not, Battle Construction Vehicle is not based Based on any pre-existing property. I was completely ready to believe that this was the game version of a manga that ran for like eight pages and had an anime that lasted two days, to the point I was convinced people close to me were just lying when they said this game wasn't based on anything. But somehow this game just manages to exist. Battle Construction Vehicle was released in June of 2000, a mere three months after the launch of the PS2 in Japan. It's so old that the game is noteworthy for being one of the first to switch over from CD-ROMs to DVD-ROMs. RIVETING! The game eventually came stateside after it was imported from Europe. Yeah, this game never got localized in America and was instead only localized in Europe a full three years after its initial release. The most noteworthy thing to come out of this game's European localization was the fact that every character in the game was given a thick British accent. Uh, you're tough, Gramps. Listen to me. You must succeed your father. I beg you, young master. Shut it. Gramps, I left because I didn't want to do just that. So he's dead. <sighs> Still no reason to change my mind. What a heap of junk! The controls on this thing suck! Oh boy, they translated it from one language I can't understand to another! How are you supposed to trust them when they can't even pronounce it right? Vehicle. Grow up! So the story of the game is that you play as Hayato Kongo, an incredibly British name, the heir to the Kongo Construction Company. Cannot stress enough how few Ks there are in that title. You want to carve out your own path in life, but after your father dies, you have to take over the family business and stop the evil construction company from evilly constructing buildings. Watch as they nefariously get zoning permits. Our first match and we really get to feel what it would be like to fight someone in construction equipment. Oh my god. You know what, I'm glad there's an obscure game that's also terrible. We've had way too many hidden gems. I want some hidden fool's gold. So you control the game with the D-pad and attack with square, triangle, and circle, and use the X button to block. Each attack button corresponds to a direction for your construction vehicle to attack, and if you get hit enough, you get to do a super move. If the game gets stressed out, it will put you in a clash where some indecipherable British noise happens and you probably have to hit a button. I don't know, this only ever happened once and I never figured out how to actually trigger it, so for all I know this was a shared illusion we're all having right now. So 
already sound like pretty simple controls, but is there any hidden depth? This is a game all about hitting construction vehicles together. Do you really think there's going to be any hidden subtleties? The movement in this game may be the worst that I've ever experienced. It's honestly kind of impressive somebody heard the criticism, this character controls like construction equipment, and thought that would be a good thing to make a game out of. Eh, that's one thing you can't hold against this game. It accurately depicts what it would be like if two excavator drivers wanted to fight. You move so slowly and awkwardly in this game. You're constantly veering off course, slamming into walls and trash left on the field. It's an absolute pain to control. Even worse, the game has the worst camera possible. It's constantly shifting throughout the fight, but as the camera changes, the controls don't. It's so disorienting and throws you off your rhythm that it's impossible to actually get in and do damage. That's compounded by the problem with actually attacking. So I don't block because I believe in myself, so that leaves me with just the attack buttons, but the square and circle buttons attack from side to side, which is completely useless in about half the vehicles since they can only attack forward, so really you only have the triangle button to attack with. Except these are the frailest construction vehicles ever made since being attacked makes it so your own attack gets interrupted. That means fights are often just complete steamrolls in either direction depending on who gets the first hit in. If you get the first hit, you just hammer triangle over and over, tank a super hit or two that don't do enough damage to actually threaten you, or get hit first and have to sit there for the next 90 seconds until you lose. There will be some fights where you genuinely don't feel like you can do anything because they have a smaller, faster vehicle that can keep hitting you with super attacks since they also charge quicker on smaller vehicles. And I think that the worst thing I can really say about this game is that despite being about one of the most primally stupid and fun ideas that a toddler would come up with, making heavy machinery hit each other, it's really boring! The only spice to these fights are the super moves, but once you've seen one, you've seen them all. You'd think they're gonna be really silly and out there after seeing the kendo stick one, but that's the highlight. Everything else is just a letdown that gets to be a drag after the second or third time you see it. Outside of those super moves, the fights just devolve into way too realistic battles of two water heaters trying to do the tango. It's painfully slow, and everything about the game lets down how silly the concept is. There's only like five or six vehicles in the game, and half of them all control the same. The fights aren't flashy or interesting. The story is the most cliched anime plot you could think up. They throw in a dog who drives a crane, and it's still boring. I played through the whole story mode in about an hour and a half, and the only thing of note is that Mr. Evil Construction is your real dad, and the girl that you want to date is also his daughter, and the game really makes makes you sweat it up until the last possible second to say, by the way, you are adopted, so if you do want to bonk in the future, it's not weird. There is a passionate gay sex scene, and even the people watching don't look interested. When you hear there's a construction vehicle fighting game, you think, well, that's gotta be totally ridiculous. And then you see that it's mostly played straight. Sir, this is not a game. This is two construction vehicles smashing into each other. Do you find something funny about that? This game is funny and ridiculous and worth your time for the first 30 seconds of the first round you ever play. And after playing 16 chapters of this, it never goes full circle to be so bad it's good. For the next game, it's time to go back to your favorite thing and mine, history lessons. Le Miserable was written in 1862 by French novelist Victor Hugo and covers the events of French life from 1815 to 1832, culminating in the June Rebellion of Paris. The novel follows characters like Jean Valjean, a man who spent 19 years of his life in prison before becoming a mayor, surrogate father, and revolutionary. Fontaine, a woman abandoned with her child by her lover who is forced to work for Madame and Monsieur Thénardier, eventually sell selling her teeth, hair, and body to afford the increasing costs of living, before passing away in Valjean's care. You have Javert, a ruthless cop who follows Valjean to the ends of the earth in a desperate bid to throw him back in jail, only to end up killing himself after being shown mercy by Valjean, too proud to accept the object of his hatred being the only one responsible for letting him live. The book is filled with real human emotions, struggles, and hardships, triumphs against the cold indifference of a society that would see a man as capable and with such capacity for good as Jean Valjean and condemn him to a life of misery for a single mistake. A book that seeks to sharply criticize the time it was written in, going after society for burning through its people and leaving them in darkness, while still leaving the light of human decency to keep us going, in characters like Muriel taking in Valjean after he gets out of prison and forgiving him for stealing his silverware to juxtapose the relentless and dogged pursuit of Javert, who will never let Valjean live down his past, or in the Thenardier's insatiable greed and lust for wealth 
wealth, contrasted by Valjean's own unending willingness to help other people. There's a reason it's considered to be one of the greatest works of the 19th century that I've never read. It's been adapted into hundreds of play productions, no less than eight film adaptations, even an anime adaptation, which I'm pretty sure if Victor Hugo saw would fucking kill him. Also, there are a pair of sequels that were not written by Victor Hugo that are to be taken as seriously as My Immortal is to Harry Potter. But it is a shame because these adaptations, however good they may be, always seem to miss the core that the original story so poignantly put in its preface. So long as there shall exist, by virtue of law and custom, decrees of damnation pronounced by society, artificially creating hells amid the civilization of Earth, and adding the element of human fate to divine destiny, so long as the three great problems of the century, the degradation of man through pauperism, the corruption of women through hunger, and the crippling of capitalism casual play through complex command inputs are unresolved. Not once in any adaptation have they ever mentioned Valjean has a 360 command grab. Cosette never even attempts to pull off her level 3 hyper combo, despite it being clearly stated on page 225 that she has full bars, and there isn't even so much as a wink or a nod to the most important character they keep cutting out, Robo Valjean. I swear, it's like literacy is dead or something. Arm Joe! There are some fighting games with far out concepts, but at the very least you can rationalize how they got there. Fight Crab, Waku Waku 7, even something like Battle Construction Vehicle. All of these at least make sense that someone would want to see these things fight. But the characters of Les Miserables? It takes a special kind of freak to make this sort of connection, and it took Takase, a Japanese indie developer, to make it happen. Arm Joe, which is a corruption of the Japanese name for Les Miserables, is a standard 1v1 fighting game where the major characters of the story duke it out to prove... something? The futility of fighting against society? Maybe just that a game about French revolutionaries who can do Hadoukens is possible. Going through the arcade mode as Javert, I got to see the fact that, no, this is not just some slapdash job putting Les Miserables characters over other fighting games. They went through real trouble to make this an accurate game to the book. Now, there are some exceptions, like the Thenardiers, who at the end of the play see the wife dying in prison and the husband exiled from France to become a slave owner in America, after having worked Fontaine into her deathbed and attempting to blackmail Valjean. And in this game, he does have a very powerful fart attack. You also have Cosette, Valjean's adopted daughter, who uses him as a projectile. For every one of those, you have Marius' level 3, which takes the song Empty Chairs at Empty Tables, a heart-wrenching number where Marius laments and believes his revolutionary friends died for nothing, which the game reimagines as a fucking skeleton parade! Unjolas can drop the revolutionary barricade on you, and I was fully prepared going into this to make a joke about how they turned Javert's suicide into a level 3. But then I realized, Oh wait, this body splash move, that's him throwing himself into the river! Of course they'd include that as a move. No, his actual level 3 was summoning a swarm of meteors. You know, just like in Dog Eat Dog. Also, I can't stress enough how you think it would be the easiest thing possible, but this game doesn't feature any music from Les Miserables. I don't know guys, I don't think Takase was that big of a fan of Les Mis in all honesty. My arcade run was going absolutely fantastic until I got to the fight with Valjean. In the story, Valjean is described as as strong as four men, which was translated into gameplay as him only needing four hits to kill me. I gotta say, it was an incredibly bold choice to make the ending of Javert's story mode the canon ending where Valjean beats the fuck out of him. If you do manage to get past Valjean, good luck at that, you're gonna get to fight Judgment, the real final boss. He is not any character from Les Mis, instead he's the character Yojiro Hanma from Baki the Grappler, who is so busted in every sense that he's nearly impossible to beat. I love how Takase couldn't think of a way to make the inescapability of society's wrongdoings into a final boss, and just found a different, really strong guy from a manga he liked and made that the boss instead. He can combo you while being hit, that's just what we're dealing with here, folks. I can say that after playing this one man-made indie fighting game from 2006 based on a French novel's arcade mode, it's actually really, really fun. This game is so janky and weird with moon jumps, super hard inputs, and random damage numbers, but it's really, really fun, guys. You don't know the simple pleasures of doing flash kicks as Javert or seeing Cosette do a picture-perfect RKO or Pon Pon. 
Bonbon! It's such an anomaly in how this game shouldn't work as well as it does. The sprite art is passable to nearly broken, backgrounds are sometimes just photos of real places, the characters' names are in English, the text is in Japanese, and the characters talk in French, but god, it's just really fun to play! Armjo is a game that needs to be played to be believed. There's nothing else quite like it, and it's the perfect example of something being better than the sum of its parts. If you looked at any individual element from this game in a vacuum from the mechanics to the artwork to the description of the game, it sounds like a mess, but when it all comes together, it's a mess, but it's so enjoyable that you don't really care if the frame data is good or not. Look, Robo Valjean is firing a laser beam in 19th century France. It's too goofy to be mad at, but also too competent to be broken. Now, let's talk about you. Yes, you. I've seen you there the whole time. Pervert, what keeps you from playing fighting games? Fighting games are super cool. They're fun to watch. The community sometimes isn't tearing itself apart. So what's stopping you? Well, if you're like most people, the answer is pretty simple. Fighting games are hard. You may not want to memorize hundreds of move inputs, lack the dexterity to pull them off, don't want a flowchart's worth of options to get out of guard. Why isn't there a fighting game for the low IQ troglodytes who like fighting games, but don't like playing fighting games? I kick. Born out of a 16-hour play session of Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and delirious jokes taken too far, Dive Kick's name doubles as a tutorial. You can dive, which is really more of a jump, but don't be a narc, and kick! Okay, we definitely got that one right. Every round ends after a single kick, because when all you can do is dive and kick and you can't even do that right, what's the point of continuing? That's all there is! If you're not diving, you're kicking, and if you aren't dive kicking, you're seriously missing a step. So what is there to talk about with a game whose control scheme can be summarized in under three words? Words. Well, considering they cobbled together a tier list for this game, you can guess there are some complexities. For starters, not every character just dives and kicks. Now, the characters of dive and kick do do that, but then you have the Baz and his swinging kicks, Dr. Scholl's and her multi-directional kicks, and Stream's corkscrew kick. Then there are characters who have gimmicks separate from all things both dive and kick, like Jafali getting a larger head every time he lands a kick, or Markman scouring the ground for parts to make the officially licensed dive kick fight stick. Every character has two super moves, a super state, and a whole boatload of intricacies. For the record, I went with Baz for my first arcade run because you know, and he's super fun getting to swing all across the stage, but I think my favorite is Dr. Scholl's. Not only is her kick super easy to land and her multi-directional dive super tricky to learn, but she's also a massive send-up to the best fighting game character of all time, Marvel vs. Capcom 3 Doctor Doom. Dive Kick is a super fun and intense mind game of trying to get your opponent to slip up before you do, with all the fun of a normal fighting game packed into only two buttons. You have footsies, range control, approach options, everything a normal fighter has just bundled into perhaps the easiest to understand fighting game available. The game Games developers set out to make a game where every single round gets the same reaction that a buzzer beater last second turnaround at an EVO tournament would get. And it's incredible that the game got the chance to have that sort of reaction at EVO itself. That's right, not only did this game get to appear at EVO, but CEO, Combo Breaker, any fighting game tournament worth its salt was showcasing what Dive Kick could do. That's on top of all the other systems at play, like Double KOs, the Timeout System, and Fraud Detection, which I think is the perfect time to talk about what really makes this game amazing. This is a fighting game made to celebrate the community around fighting games. Almost every character in the game is either a reference to a famous character or in-joke in the fighting game community. Heck, a few characters just are the people from the fighting game community. You have Jafali, based on CEO tournament organizer Jabaley, whose massive ego served as the inspiration for his increasing head size gimmick. Markman being Mark Julio, a Mad Cat spokesperson who literally builds a controller mid-match. Mr. N is based on Marn, who killed the Guilty Gear competitive scene for a time thanks to match fixing, and was punished by being on the receiving end of the best fighting game clip of all time. Bionic, Bionic arm. arm! Bionic Arm! OTG! Bionic Arm! Giving set! He has another chance! He's down! He's He's too many! Bionic Arm! Even the game's final boss is based on Seth Killian, making him the only man with two different fighting game final bosses named after him. The in-jokes don't even begin to end with the characters, though. This game has a gem system to enhance your moves based on a f***ing...
an ancient controversy with Street Fighter Cross Tekken's on disc DLC. The backgrounds are filled with tons of references to community in jokes like When's Marvel, character quotes referencing fighting game insider terms, and the fraud detection and choking alarms. If you manage to win not a single round against your opponent four times in a row, you'll be branded a fraud, and if you lose again, well, nothing happens, but everybody knows you're a fraud. The choke alarm is the same, but happens when you win four games in a row and then immediately lose four games in a row. All of these jokes and references, not all of which being especially flattering, come together to make a game that filled a slot that no other had before. This was a game that loved its community as much as the community loved it. Dive Kick was the first real game to look at the fighting game community as a community and most importantly, poke fun at itself. Fighting games are serious business, it's a sport to a lot of people, and there's nothing wrong with getting passionate and heated about something you train day in and day out for. But at the end of the day, just like with sports, there's such a thing as taking yourself too seriously, and that goes doubly for video games. Dive Kick, from its flash game presentation, simplistic controls, and caricatures of prominent fighting game iconography, is one of the only competitively viable fighting games that isn't meant to be taken too seriously. However, just because you're not supposed to take the game seriously doesn't mean the developers didn't take it seriously, as, in a shocking twist, Dive Kick was one of the first major fighting games to include rollback netcode. Anybody currently not using tape to hold their glasses together is very confused as to what rollback netcode is, so let me explain. Rollback netcode is the infrastructure of a game's online element that makes it so instead of applying a delay to your move so that every character moves as if the game was being played locally, each character performs their action and then it just takes a moment for the animation to play out for the other character. Have you ever had a video buffer while the audio continues and then the video speeds by super fast to catch up? Yeah, it's kind of the same thing, but with Ryu. It's famous for making online fighters run smooth as butter, and for not being in Dragon Ball Fighters. Thank you very much, Arc System Works. Dive Kick, a small-scale indie game with graphics that their mother would call oh, good, but simple, and a control scheme made for play on Donkey Kong Bongos had rollback netcode years and years before it became the standard across fighting games. This led to the game having a super thriving online scene with weekly tournaments hosted in-game that people would practice at, and practice they did. It can be argued that in its heyday, Dive Kick had one of the most cutthroat competitive metas of all time. The lack of systems at work meant that the game often came down to simply who played the game better, and it was a massive success. Nowadays, Dive Kick is somewhat unfairly looked back upon as a novelty by the wider gaming landscape, similar to games like Goat Simulator or Surgeon Simulator. In reality, the community it not only cultivated but celebrated saw it for what it was, a love letter to fighting games as a whole. I want to make, like, Evo, but all the games are bad. I want main stage basketball combos in Hokuto no Ken. I want the crowd to take a bathroom break during the BCV finals. Arm Joe Brackets decided by who can best recite the song Empty Chairs and Empty Tables. And Dive Kick, because it's a real fighting game. Let's go, crappy Evo 2023! <laughs>